let's move on to our next and final speaker of the day. Uh, hi, Michelle. I don't know if I pronounced correctly your name. I hope so. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no, great. And so right. let me try sharing uh, here. Yes, and let me let give me know. a very short process, sure, yeah. intro to you. So Michel um, uh, van de Pane obtained his uh, bachelor from um, bachelor diploma from University of Calgary, then master and PhD from University of Toronto, where he was also a faculty member. And since uh, 2002, he has been at the uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, he has founded companies that develop games and educational programs, visited INRIA, and develops really impressive work on how to actuate and, and make life human avatars, let's say. And I'm very excited about his presentation as well. Okay, many thanks for the uh, invite. Uh, first of all, can you hear me and see the screen? We're good? Not the screen. We not see screen. you, but not your screen. You still have to. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Let me do that. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, let's yes. see. Is that good? Okay. Excellent. Good. Okay. Yes, um, great. Thanks. Yeah. So today I'll be talking, uh, shifting a little bit to talking about uh, locomotion uh, in, instead of manipulation. So locomotion is, is a topic that, that's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and I work, come at these problems from the perspective of both the animation, uh, robotics, and uh, reinforcement learning uh, more recently. Um, so th there have been just, uh, there's been a lot of fantastic discussion so far. And so uh, just as a way of, of framing the, the way I'm thinking about these things, um, there's, uh, we've seen uh, all kinds of work related to learning state abstractions, you know, in, in computer vision, obviously, and I think what's lacking somehow is, uh, or is, is hopefully the existence of equivalent action abstractions. And this has a, a huge history, of course, and so there's, I have a, a whole vocabulary of words uh, uh, um, describing how, how the community, uh, various parts of the community have thought about these pieces over time. And I, I won't have any, any uh, you know, uh, uh, resounding answers to, to any one of these things, but, uh, but these are all, uh, there, there's so much work to be done. It's, it's a great time to be in this area, I think. So um, I'm gonna start with a discussion of, of uh, touch briefly on, on three topics. And the first one is just low level action spaces. So just thinking uh, briefly about, um, you know, the uh, where a lot of work in the reinforcement learning community assumes the environment comes as a given and, and that you, you're, you're working with torques in some simulator. Um, but there's many other things you can use. So you can use, we can use target angles to give us some kind of, some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, to give us some kind of position control. We can use target angular velocities or we can use muscles. And so, so how does the choice of, this low level action space really affect kind of modern uh, policy gradient uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, so just uh, as a review, uh, the current work is, is all over the map in terms of choices for the low level action space. And so commonly we've seen lots of work on that, that uses torques. Um, that seems to be the default. Um, so, and uh, if you move to the biomechanics community, then uh, muscle activations are something you, you care a lot about. And so this introduces both contraction dynamics and uh, possible elasticity in the tendons and uh, also activation dynamics. And so, um, yeah, and, and this has also uh, spilled over into the machine learning community with the, the, the NeurIPS uh, uh, dynamic locomotion challenge um, th this is just briefly just some uh, some work uh, some of our own work on this from a few years ago. So the nice thing here is that there, there's no motion capture. We're just op optimizing for metabolic energy and changing um, changing to different target gates gate speeds and and so as a result you you get these natural looking um, uh, motions that that emerge from from this action space. This is one of my favorites, a, a walking gait that, that actually shifts over into a hopping gait as the most efficient way to, to move forward at a slightly different speed. Anyhow, the, the, there's lots of interesting work to be done with, uh, with uh, muscle-based actuation. Uh, then um, we can look at using, um, we, yeah, we can look at, use, oh yeah, sorry. 
Uh, we can look at using uh, proportional derivative controllers. And so, um, so this has been used in, in uh, really a large variety of work in computer animation and, and robotics. Uh, and it, we've used this on some uh, work in, uh, for the CASI robot. Um, so, and, and I will mention that an advantage of using pro, uh, proportional derivative controllers on, uh, on the real robot CASI is that uh, the, um, by having your, your policy uh, spit out control uh, uh, desired target positions, then uh, you can run your PD, uh, your PD action loop can run at, uh, at uh, multiple kilohertz on the actual robot platform. And, and that's actually a, a key part for making sim to real work uh, for, for that setting for, for uh, using uh, deep RL policy gradient algorithms for, uh, for, uh, for real, walking in a, in, a, in a real biped. Um, and then lastly, okay, there, there have been also some papers that actually use just the derivative term of your PD controller. And so you, you're, you can basically set target velocities um, as, a, um, uh, as a control parameter as well. And so, so how do these uh, all fare when you actually try to compare these? Uh, uh, you know, does it matter at all? Or do, do some offer uh, much better, um, much faster learning or maybe achieve better controls? Um, so we, we did some work on this uh, uh, just a few years ago, uh, where we, in this case, we're benchmarking them on uh, just a motion imitation task. So what you see on the left here is, is a reference motion that we're trying to some, uh, which could be physically feasible or it might not, it doesn't have to be. Um, and we're trying to imitate that. So, so that's the loss function is just trying to imitate this motion. And we get the, um, we get the control on the, uh, on, on the right hand side here. Um, and so, uh, so just to uh, jump forward to the, um, uh, let's see here. Okay, yeah. So, so here, here's what this looks like for an example result. So, so this is we're just trying to imitate a biped run. Uh, the animation's a, a little bit choppy here because of of, of the various uh, things going on during the talk. But um, but they can all do reasonably well. And if we look at the actual uh, learning speed here. Um, basically, uh, it turns out using uh, for this kind of imitation task using PD controllers is, is almost uh, uh, with reasonably tuned uh, uh, spring and damping gains. Then, um, then uh, it, it generally turns out to be by, by far the best approach. Um, torques are somewhere in the middle for this case, and, and the muscle based uh, learning was surprisingly uh, surprisingly uh, took the longest to learn for, for this particular. Uh, this particular task. Um, here's a slightly di different motion. So in this case, it's a bounding dog. Again, PD control learns learns the fastest, and uh, and uh, torques in this case is is, is the hardest to learn. Uh, so in, in general, the you know the, the results here seems to be that uh, that learning PD targets uh, is actually is beneficial for any kind of. Uh, imitation style task and, and we've seen this with, with a number of motion capture related papers motion capture imitation papers that uh, that i'll talk about in a second so, so people have traditionally stuck with with pd control targets as as actions um you could ask okay if you're not doing an imitation task if i just give you some new reward objective then uh, uh then how does it fare and and so he, so here the story is much more mixed and so so in some cases uh, pd does a little bit better and in other cases, uh, like on the on the right for the hopper, it, it actually learns more quickly at the beginning, and then, uh, but it doesn't have, uh, uh, but it 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 then fares worse. It doesn't achieve the same performance uh, in the end. Um, so overall, the the story is more mixed, um, and so so the but uh, the, the but nevertheless, what you choose does make a difference. Um, one last comment I'll, I'll make on on these choices is that uh, in the reinforcement learning literature, often what what's missing is uh, is is a, a thorough treatment of, of the actual control time step as as an important hyperparameter, and so so this is kind of buried in the details of many papers saying, oh, we use action repeat is equal to four, which, which basically means, okay, we're going to run at a control time step that, that's four times larger than, than what the simulation time step is. And so, um, so basically uh, many different algorithms, if, if you have the wrong, uh, yeah, if, if you're using the wrong uh, control time step scale, 
for, for this for the discrete time discretization of the control problem, then then that can radically impact on on how fast your your method learns and or uh, what kind of result you achieve. And uh, so I, I just thought I would draw attention to this uh, when when looking at work from from the from the reinforcement learning uh, uh, literature. Um, so uh, I'd next, like to just bump up a little bit in level of abstraction, and so and and point to a uh, uh, quite a consistent uh, uh, trend that we're seeing, uh, at least in 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 animation, and and I think uh, some of this can spill over into 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 robotics, perhaps, or maybe there are, are lessons to be learned here, which is that which is the following. So. Um, we can draw on large uh, databases of motion capture data and uh, and try to imitate these. And so, so we can learn controllers to imitate given motion capture clips uh, using standard uh, you know, deep reinforcement learning policy graded algorithms. And so there, there are some tricks to getting this to work right, but but these are these are now pretty well known. So uh, yeah, uh, some of these were introduced in in this deep mimic paper in in 2018. And so um, here, the, the policy it, it takes uh, it takes a, a state as input, and it also takes a motion phase as input. So it's basically a number between zero and one that says how far along are you in the motion that you're trying to imitate, and uh, the reward or, or the, the loss function. Uh, yeah, well, the, the reward is is simply the uh, is simply a distance of how far is your current motion from the motion that you're trying to imitate. And so you can learn a, a policy which will, which will be quite actually uh, quite robust to various perturbations. And so, um, um, but so, so this type of setup, actually the, the policy basically learns to memorize the motion uh, and, and it can, uh, using a time index. Um, so what we've seen, uh, oh, and so, so, so here's just a, a, b a brief uh, animation of, uh, say, a spin kick. So this was originally a motion capture spin kick, but now what you're seeing here is a, is a simulation that, that runs quite well in real time. And you can add some additional goals to that. So it's trying to kick the red ball at the same time as it's trying to do its best to imitate this, this overall kicking motion. Um, but what we've seen more recently is is actually instead of having if you have uh, you know a hundred different motions, then you need a hundred different control policies. Uh, a better way to set this up is actually to um, is is actually to uh, to condition not on the on uh, on a time index motion, but but actually to condition your policy on some some snapshot of the future motion. So this is S hat here. And so, so you're looking up to t, up to K time steps into the future of what you'd like to do. Um, you could think of this as being some kind of inverse dynamics, right? Where, where if I give you S hat at, at uh, T plus one, then uh, you, know, you, you, could, you could compute some kind of acceleration from that. And, uh, but in general, um, if you're about to do a jump, then you, you might want to actually anticipate all the way through uh, until the landing of the jump, just because uh, in, in many cases you, you 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 will be unable to compensate in the air for for various aspects of the underactuated motion, and so it, it's important to to get a sufficient time window of the motion you want to imitate, and so um so let's just call this online motion imitation. So this is like the, the online version of of deep mimic. And, um, and really, the, the desired motion becomes the action space here, right? So if I give you some desired uh, motion clip, then I, I have the sliding window uh, of the future expected motion that, that I'd like to see. And then the, the policy can, can learn to do that. Now, of course, I, I do need to learn a generator, some generator G, which actually uh, generates uh, desired motions, which are, which are both feasible and which might satisfy some some goal that I'm trying to accomplish. And so, to some extent, it, yeah, if if we have a generator that spews out impossible motions or motions that are too difficult, that then our policy will fail. And so, so we're pushing part of the problem onto our generator. Um, but, but this is a common trend that that we're seeing in, in recent work. And so, uh, so uh, below, I've I've listed five different papers that that basically do different versions of this, where you are. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's doing uh, given a short snapshot of the, of the future desired motion, um, we're producing policies that that are conditioned on that. 
And, and so th th this is kind of related a lot to, uh, to, um, to, to uh, basically predictive perception approaches to control. So, so basically there's a lot of work that, that says, well, when we're trying to control actions, we're, we're really trying to, we're, we're trying to, uh, um, yeah, that the, uh, the action is, um, uh, yeah, the, the, that we're really trying to achieve a given perception um, when we try to execute an action. Um, so, so here's how this works. This is, uh, this is from the, the paper that's listed below. So, um, so the generator is producing a, a prediction that, that tries to walk towards the flag. And this is, uh, and so it then receives an unexpected perturbation. And so here you're seeing this, this hallucinated prediction window, which is produced by, by the smart generator. And, uh, and then the, the, the controller here is, is doing all the hard work of, of trying to, of, of robustly following that projected, that, that uh, predicted window. Um, so my, my point in showing you this is, is that these, these five papers, they, they all now work with, with uh, that they, they really are training at fairly large scales, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hours of motion capture data. And so, um, so working with desired motion uh, snapshots, uh, short time windows, as an action space is 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 becoming uh, a, a quite a feasible thing, at least in this context of of motion capture data. Um, th this is, a, and of course, you can use various things as a generator. Th this is actually just a purely kinematic. Uh, th th this is actually a, an example of a generator that you could use. So this is some recent work that we have where we're learning an, an auto an auto regressive uh, variational autoencoder trained on motion capture data. And, and, and then to, to produce new kinematic motion here, uh, but but you could also imagine uh, train uh, yeah uh, training this uh, yeah, uh, using the output of this generator as the input for for one of these learned motion tracking controllers, and so so that's something that that we're excited to experiment with uh, next. Um, yeah, and, and j just to wrap up, the uh, one last piece of uh, work that uh, I'll just quickly touch on is that. Um, yeah, state spaces and action spaces, um, it, it almost doesn't make sense to talk about them separately. And so, uh, because I, I think in, for many continuous control tasks, the, the idea of, for example, of, of applying a random action is, is just, is, it seems completely silly. And so um, in, in reality, what, what we need to do is, is or what uh, the way progress is often made is, is to learn in incremental and progressive fashions. And so, so this is recent work that, that I'm quite excited about, where um, we're learning solutions to, to 3D stepping stone problems. And so, so we have a, this is a preprint that's uh, available uh, on archive. And so, um, so here's the problem. We're trying to solve a stepping stone task. So we're giving uh, a sequence of, of stepping stones uh, that, that's fixed in advance. So, so we tell you, we, we're basically telling the character where to step. In fact, more specifically, we tell the character the location and pitch of the next two of the next two upcoming steps, and so so so, so that's a 5D parameterization. So 3D for the location, and another 2D for for the pitch and roll of of the of the next step. Um, so given the actual state of the character and kind of ten numbers that describe the, these two upcoming steps, we define a reward function. And, and we want to train uh, from scratch a, a, a walking motion or running motion that, that can solve these tasks. And so um, we're going to go about this by, uh, by using a curriculum. So we're going to begin by applying easy, solving for easy steps and then solving for harder steps. And so um, um, uh, as opposed to uh, our baseline will be uniform sampling. So I, I could throw the character into an environment that, that has some, some mix of steps, some easy steps, some difficult steps, and I just sample from the uniformly and I, I train uh, using, uh, using samples from this uniform environment. Um, but, it, it, uh, but, but this basically fails. And so what you need to do is, is, is have some kind of uh, easy to hard ordering of the steps. And so, so if, if there were just a two dimensional uh, parameter domain for the steps here, let's say the step length and, and the step height. And so, um, so the, the easy steps might be at the middle of this domain. And so, so medium length steps so with, with no height change. 
Um, so I, I could start training on those and then gradually introducing step height variations and step length variations as I sweep along here. So this is kind of a fixed order curriculum on the left here. Um, you could also imagine some kind of an adaptive curriculum where I, I don't want to practice the steps that are too easy because I already, I already know how to do them. And I don't want to practice the steps that are too hard. And so uh, instead, I want to focus my effort on, on steps that are, that are neither too easy nor too hard. And so, so, um, so all of these work roughly equally well. We, we, we were hoping that the adaptive method would really do much, much better than, than the fixed order method. But it turns out, it, as long as you have any kind of uh, reasonable, reasonable ordering of the task difficulty, you can do quite well. Um, so here's what this looks like. So this has learned from, from scratch using an objective. There, there, there's, no, there's no motion data involved here. And um, so you can learn to, to climb up and, and uh, down some, some pretty steep steps. Um, in order to get the motions looking realistic, you do have to make the character very, fairly weak. And so, so we, we set the torque limits to be, to be quite low. And you'll see in a second that we also run this up for the Cassie model. Um, so this is a, a different running gait. Um, yeah, th this is an example of, of the kind of torture test that uh, it needs to solve. And um, yeah, so, so, um, uh, so with, a, with a good curriculum, you really can uh, learn these kinds of tasks uh, from scratch. And so here's a, uh, here's a crazy, the last crazy task. Here's what this looks like on Cassie. So, so this is kind of a, an initial, uh, well, okay, okay. Um, let me go back to Cassie, sorry. Where's Cassie? Uh, all right, let's play this here. Um, so, so this is an initial gate for Cassie. And so this is, um, so, so this is the same, using the same Cassie simulator from which we have done successful sim to real. When, needless to say, we have not actually uh, tried to do sim to real for, for these kinds of stepping stone tasks yet. Uh, but it is using the same uh, simulator for which we uh, for which we have done successful sim to real uh, with Cassie. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and and here's a failure result. You'll see just just to just to give you some sense of of, of what failures do look like. Uh, but we can do all these uh, all these uh, kinds of spiral staircases and, and and other different scenarios. And so uh, once you can um, once you've trained on these different kinds of steps, then of course you can. You can treat. You can walk across variable terrain. Um, so, so here, the, there's just a very basic path planner that's been hooked up to this, and so we can walk both up and down uh, across variable terrain, uh, as well as as well as step sequences. And uh, so, so we're, we're doing further work on on the path planning here. Um, that's basically uh, all I, I wanted to to touch on these these three different areas. So, so I'd like to acknowledge the. The work of, of all the uh, uh, all the grad students who who basically did all the real work on all these projects, and uh, yeah, so so to conclude, um, there's uh, a lot more to be understood about even about low level action spaces, and um, and then moving up to a higher level, I, I think um, uh, that dealing with uh, with desired motions or desired perceptions as a possible action space is actually uh, starting to be look like it's a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, and then lastly, uh, I, th I think uh, curriculum, we need to be looking a lot more at, at curricula for various tax tasks, uh, because I, I think uh, many, many things um, can be learned in, in an incremental fashion. Um, and then it, it, perhaps in the panel later, uh, talking about learning about uh, across multiple time scales and, and more. Uh, so I think that, uh, that wraps it up. I would love to uh, to have some questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, we have time for one or two pressing questions. I have one question. Um, actually, for you, and I don't know if Marcus is still around. Um, so you 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 were discussing about desire motion as uh, action space, which I think is is really cool and um, it's a very very good idea. And it somehow relates also to Mark's uh, Mark's work, where um, at the end um, the optimization problem is about the trajectory. I was wondering yeah. how do you see this to be extended for um, for problems where 
is not just about kinematics. It's not about motion. You want to, for example, maybe change the state of the world in a certain way. You want to, I don't know, cook something or change the uh, switch on a light. So it's something that is not well defined directly on kinematics. I don't know if you think there is always going to be a way to transfer any any manipulation task into a kinematic trajectory that you want to achieve, or if you think this can be extended to um, to something extra apart from just having motion as the action space. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, so I I, I think the hope is to eventually to be able to connect uh, all of these. So, so that the, the desired actions can become more and more abstract and, uh, you know, maybe eventually symbolic. And um, yeah, and, and, and the question is, um, yeah, uh, to what extent can, can those be specified? Yeah, to what extent can, can that structure all be learned uh, bottom up um, so that uh, w with sufficient practice you, you and, and across multiple time scales, right? So, so I, I think there's, there's a, maybe yeah um so certainly in the field of of, of rl we, we don't talk enough about about the crazy different time skills that that we want to work on for different problems and and uh and that the that the problems change very much at, at, at the different time scales and and then they all need to be woven together so uh um yeah but 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 i, I do think that um uh that that by dealing with uh the nice thing about spitting out desired motions or you know uh, introducing a trajectory back as an action is that uh, in this case the the learned low level policy tracking policy it, it's doing all the feedback related work for you and so so all of that's being just offloaded and and then the the higher level uh, generator can can basically can just focus on oh look here's here's a, here's an overall trajectory um, now, I don't know if that's always the, the, the best strategy to, to truly offload that, but, um, but that, that is a partial separation of time scales. Thanks. Uh, Miros, I think there is a couple of questions. Yes, there's, there's a couple. I think we maybe with this answer, we, we covered a bit, one of them, but I guess uh, one question that is posed is, on what challenges remain for bipedal locomotion? Because it seemed uh, from the simulated videos that uh, it was already handling uneven terrain quite well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so I, I think, um, uh, yeah. Let's see what I, I mean. So, so uh, uh, you know, it's true sim to real for for these kinds of things. I, I, because it, it, it's one thing to get it working in simulation, and and everyone knows it's it's another thing to get it working on on the real robot. Um, there's uh, lots of work re related to planning. So, so um, uh, uh, planners that that uh, planners that can inter that can interrogate the policy to see if, if you're looking at a large terrain. You don't necessarily want to plan each step uh, uh, in advance, but but you do want to look at the terrain to to determine okay wh wh where is the best feasible path for me to walk and, and which part of the terrain will be the most difficult. So so integration with with planning and, and yeah and, and just just still much faster learning. So so I, I do think that uh, we can leverage things from model predictive control. So uh, Boston Dynamics recently gave a talk uh, that, uh, on how on some of their MPC uh, or, or their, um, their trajectory optimization uh, template based work. And so, so th that could still be integrated. Um, that, that would be a lot more effective than, than, than kind of this, this add random noise to the action space exploration that, that we're currently using for the RL. So there, there's a lot of uh, speed up to, to be had there, but uh, but I, I do feel that uh, that that yeah I'm I'm excited by by the recent progress in, in the field uh, in general. Uh, 